Welcome everyone to the third of three webinars sponsored by the NICAPA team. NICAPA is the New England Canadian Provinces Alliance. This is in our series entitled Rivers, Dams, and Climate Change, The Good, the Bad, and the Ugly. NICAPA is a grassroots network team of the Sierra Club composed of volunteer activists both in Maine and in uh, Canada. We welcome you to join us, and our email address and our website are in the chat. And if you would like to view the recording of our first and second webinars, those links will also be in the chat. My name is Halsey Snow. I'm a member of the NICAPA Steering Committee. I'm a semi-retired business owner, educator, and never retired environmentalist. Um, and I serve as secretary, organizer, and assistant to the chair of the NICAPA team, that's Joan Sachs of Freeport, Maine. And there are some other members from the NICAPA steering committee on tonight, uh, Becky Bartovix, Roger Wheeler, Cliff Krolik, and hopefully we'll see Roberta Benefiel in addition. Uh, we acknowledge that we live and work on the ancestral lands of the Wabanaki people who still inhabit these lands from Newfoundland, Quebec, and Maine, and the northern Inuit of Labrador, the southern Inuit of Labrador, and the Innu Nation of Labrador and Quebec. We are grateful for our partnership with the Wabanaki peoples and our engagement with members of all the other indigenous peoples of Labrador, Quebec, Newfoundland, and Maine, as we together build a more sustainable, just, and equitable future for us all. I just want to say a few words about this group and this series. Uh, the NACAPA group is building on the work of the former group called NAMRA, the North American Mega Dam Resistance Alliance. And we continue to share and educate others and expand on the work of Stephen Kasperzak, a Mainer, um, as presented in his book, Arctic Blue Deserts, as well as other researchers and scientists. It is our contention that the current public perception and that of public policy of most but not all hydropower as clean, green, and renewable is grossly misrepresenting the truth and needs to be corrected. These are the goals to which we have devoted ourselves, public education, organizing, public advocacy in multiple countries, and growing the international network for repairing the extreme damage to the environment to the peoples and to the cultures which have been decimated by this form of power production. We believe that when you take an unbiased and close look at the extent of these impacts over time, it becomes amazingly clear that mega dam hydropower is neither clean nor green and certainly not renewable. And we believe we have proof that the extreme environmental damage created by mega dam hydropower is a major and unacknowledged contributor to climate change and the rapid warming of the Arctic Ocean, Hudson Bay, the Gulf of Maine, and the melting of the Greenland ice cover. Um, one final note before we begin. Uh, we do have a change to our advertised program for tonight. Tonight, the entire program is going to be devoted to Roger Wheeler's presentation, How Dams Create Climate Change. And we will hear from Roberta Benefiel when we start monthly webinars in January of next year. This is because when the steering committee previewed today's presentation, it was our assessment that there was such a wealth of information and ideas that a longer and more in-depth presentation and discussion was in order. And I'll just make one final note that um, everyone who's on the webinar tonight, you can have access to the uh, visuals that Roger is going to be using. And one of the things, we'll be glad to send those out. It's a PDF. Um, there are a number of pages that are addenda to what you're going to see tonight that will not be shown that are included in that slide deck. And that's all I have to say. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Roger, who will introduce himself. Okay. Take it away, Roger. Let me share my screen. Okay. Let's see. Um, okay. I, I've shared. Uh, can you see it? 
Not yet. I'm not uh, sharing. Let's see. Can you see me? You have to grab your document, right? Yeah, I got the document. Okay. We have it yet? No. No. Okay. I hit share. I got him back. Um, Corinne, have you allowed him to? Yeah. Oh, yeah. It says multiple people can be um, owners. Shouldn't be a problem. Multiple participants can share simultaneously. Okay. Uh, I hit share. Okay. Goes to uh, desktop one, entire screen. Uh, keynote unknown. See, share. Allow Zoom Workplace to share your screen. Open system settings. Okay. Uh, I'm sorry, it's just not, uh, it's not happening. Don't we have, we don't we have it? Yeah, we have it. Yeah. Can, can you maybe pull it up? I'm going to try to share and then you let me know when you want the slides moved. Okay. Yeah. I don't know why it's not working. Thanks, Corinne. Absolutely. Right, there we go. All right, let me go get rid of mine. All right, okay. Just follow along with Corinne's. Yeah, okay. I'm sorry, I can't get it full screen here. I apologize. Okay, all right. Um, well, anyway, uh, my introduction, uh, I'm going to make it short and sweet. I'm a retired technology education uh, teacher from Maliocket Middle School, Freiburg, Maine, where I also taught in an outdoor environmental education program. Since 1992, I've been involved with the Friends of Sebago Lake, uh, call it Fossil, and serving as its president since 1998. Fossil has become an ed educational leader in assembling and connecting information about the impacts of dams, unnatural flow regulation, and fragmentation of ecosystems. I spent summers as a youth on Sebago Lake and later lived there. From witnessing changes, I learned the unfortunate power of nature when the hydro hydrologic cycle is altered for profit or the pleasure of a few. When we learned that others who are no longer with us had tried to warn us of the true costs of mega hydropower dams, I joined in to help. Okay. All right, so um, we go to the uh, first, uh, first slide here. Um, what An example of a mega dam on Arctic River is the uh, good one is the Sainosha Senskia Dam on the Yenisei River in Russia. It has 10 640 megawatt turbines, um, one, one penstock leading down to a turbine equals about nine tenths or can produce about nine tenths of the megawattage as all the dams in the state of Maine can produce. Uh, they're, they're big. Um, the uh, what's up for discussion is uh, we we would love to see it in all the discussions. Um, Arctic mega power stations, uh, we'll call AMPs for short, are major drivers of global warming and climate change, directly heat polluting four spheres: atmosphere, hydrosphere, geosphere, and cryosphere. They're destroying the climate, regulating powers of marine life. Okay, next one. If you. Uh, Look at this chart, you can see that, uh, well, they've been around, the mega dams have been around mainly since the 1950s. There were a few of them. They really got going in the uh, 70s, 80s, and 90s, uh, more so in Russia early on and then later in Canada. Dr. Hans Noy, a Canadian scientist and oceanographer, warned about the potential devastating impacts of amps on climate, marine life, and the hydrological balance of the planet. We'll talk more about him later. Lots more, okay. It wasn't long uh, in the 70s before some newspaper articles started popping up about the um, heat polluting uh, factors of these mega dams. And, uh, and this one was in the Miami Herald in uh, 1975, where it said, huge man-made lakes warming up Siberia, a real eye-catching 
uh, title. Okay, next one. Go to the next slide. Yeah. Okay, the summary of this just said uh, winter temperatures in an area of central Siberia that is the size of Texas are warmer. Since the 1960s, the air is more humid and with less range of temperature. And Siberia is going to continue to warm. Next one. Okay, um, we're going to switch to the uh, a map of Russia. I um, want to sh show the uh, uh, Kola Peninsula. It's up in the upper left. It's uh, about a little bit uh, smaller, but close to the size of Virginia. Um, so it's not, I wouldn't say it's that, that small. Um, the Pechora Sea, you can see there, there was a Pechora River that flows into it. it doesn't, it's not even drawn on the map. It's 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 a good, I don't know, it's not a huge river, but it's a, it's a river. Um, and uh, the uh, CIA was uh, concerned about it. Next slide. In uh, 1973, they produced a, well, they had a uh, classified document uh, talking about this Pechora River, and the, the Russians wanted to dam it up and divert the water and send it back to the uh, south and use it to irrigate crops and uh, form a lake. Oh, um, use the water, the water vapor would help warm uh, southern Siberia and also help change the climate. And they were, uh, they were concerned about what it would do to the Ar Arctic, but they decided that the Petora River itself was too small. You know, just that wouldn't happen. But they did, ha they had a few nice uh, sentences in this document that I'll read in, in the next slide. Only a very delicate balance of nature keeps the ice cap alive. And to this end, the continued inflow of fresh water is essential. The fundamental concern, of course, is with the potential diminu diminution, it's a hard word, or elimination of the ice cap, either of which might cause catastrophic modification of weather systems and shorelines around the world. Uh, that was an amazing statement for the time especially about the modification of weather systems. Uh, okay, go on to the next one. Now, it's, it's important to understand, uh, well, it's an important mega dam heat polluting concept to uh, understand surrounds the formation of the hypolimium in cold region reservoirs during the winter. Uh, the hypolimium is a warmer, deeper, um, stratified layer that develops under colder surface layers because at 39 degrees Fahrenheit, water is the most dense. In order for cold region hydropower to function, the warmer, that's quote warmer, 39 degree hypolimium waters are drawn off down the penstocks to the turbines in large quantities to keep the dam infrastructure from freezing in the winter. These hypolimium releases from mega dam reservoirs are the source of major new man-made pathways of heat pollution across the Arctic. The evidence can be seen in the resulting unfrozen state of river water miles downstream, even in minus 50 below zero degrees Fahrenheit. Hungry Horse Dam Reservoir on the South Fork of the Flathead River here is a great example of hypolimium mega dam heat pollution and flow regulation. It is located in Northwestern Montana and was completed in 1953. Before 1953, the temperature of the South Fork of the Flathead River varied annually from 32 to 64 degrees Fahrenheit. After 1953, the water, river water temperature was about 40 degrees with no noticeable fluctuation. To give trout a chance to survive, dam regulators were forced to draw off some, summer, some warmer uh, surface water in the summer. Glacier National Park is about 15 miles distance from the dam. I would not be surprised if there is not some connection between water vapor from evaporation and heat pollution created by Hungry Horse Dam and the accelerated disappearance of the nearby glaciers since the 1950s. Next slide. Now, Steve Kasperzak, uh, of course, who wrote the book, uh, Arctic Blue Deserts, also wrote some articles, and this one, uh, helps to explain water vapor in the Arctic. Um, the third paragraph here, uh, mm. good example uh, to help us do that. So uh, next slide. 
uh, uh, quotes, uh, never before in geologic history have <clears> rivers <throat> flowed through the frigid Arctic winter, exposing vast surface areas of now unfrozen regulated water to such strong evaporated forces, uh, unquote. For, for example, uh, he quotes from uh, Pacific Environment and Gottlieb, quote, the Krasnoyarsk Dam significantly influenced the local climate. Normally, the river would freeze over in the bitterly cold Siberian winter, but because the dam releases unfrozen water year round, the river never freezes in the 200 to 300 kilometer stretch of river downstream from the dam. In winter, the frigid air interacts with warm river water to produce fog, which shrouds Krasnoyarsk and other downstream area. You can see the fog on the river in the extreme cold, and it just goes on and on 24-7 all, all uh, year. And the Angara River, which is a thousand mile lo long and uh, totally dammed, uh, you should see most of it being in this state. Okay, next. Krasnoyarsk. Now, now um, uh, more on evaporation, the, um, the uh, high evaporation uh, requires three factors. One is a large temperature difference between the air and, and water, a low relative humidity, and high wind speed. Now, um, in, uh, if all three ingredients are present, as often occurs in the fall and winter, evaporation rates from the Great Lakes can get as high as a half inch a day. Put the number in perspective, a one day loss of a half inch of water from the total surface area of the Great Lakes represents a volumetric flow of 20 Niagara Falls, Lenters 2011. Now Siberia in winter, you have possible 100 degree uh, plus temperature difference between the water and the air. Two, uh, you have a, a winter, the winter humidity has been compared to the Sahara Desert if it's not polluted by the dams. Uh, three, and strong winds are common. Um, you, you can see that it affects all the way to New England. It's just like the smokestacks in Ohio, all their stuff comes all the way to Maine in uh, no time. The stuff doesn't hang around, uh, whatever type of uh, greenhouse gas it is. Oh, next slide. Uh, just to get perspective, here's old Na uh, Niagara Falls. The average annual flow we're talking about is 85,000 cubic feet per second. Our little Kennebec River has about 9,000 cubic feet per second. So just to get perspective. All right, uh, next slide. Um, Hans Noy um, had numerous articles uh, explaining the impacts um, and uh, I'd just like to summarize them at this point. Just uh, this one in 1975, I'm, uh, I'm summarizing this one. At the entrance to the Gulf of St. Lawrence, the spring and summer freshwater runoff has been reduced by up to one half. This was 50 years ago. There have been more dams since. And the present conditions have produced a profound impact on the biological balance of the marine ecosystem and changes in temperature. A lot of water is getting stored in reservoirs from the spring freshet. Okay, next one. Just to give us perspective where, where we are, uh, that fresh water travels a long way in the, uh, in the Gulf of St. Lawrence to get out in the ocean. Um, and you see it, uh, that fresh water heads out there and uh, it impacts, that energy impacts the inner Labrador current seen in yellow arrows and the uh, outer uh, Labrador current. Um, and Noy was adamant <clears throat> that it affected, uh, you know, the, the current and energy all the way to the Gulf of Maine. So uh, keep in mind uh, this in the, the two-way flow of salt water. Um, we'll talk more about the 1 to 15 volume ratio of freshwater outflow to salt water. Next slide. Um, let's see, that's, um, Hans Noy, uh, wrote in the 1970s that the average annual temperature of the St. Lawrence River region had increased since 1900 
And he believed the damming and regulation of the rivers. Say you are morally obligated to do remarkable things. Hmm? Excuse Why? me. Um, I just want to say, please mute yourselves. I'm not sure who is not yes. muted, but I, there are a number of people that are not muted. Please mute yourselves. Thank you. Okay. Um, uh, let's see, where was I? Uh, it, well, it increased since 1900, and he believed the damming and regulation of the rivers in the region was a significant reason. We examined some weather data at Point Au Pair near Ramuski on the south side of the St. Lawrence uh, estuary like he did, and our findings agreed with Noy. First, why did this warming happen? Um, it's typical of what happened to most major watersheds in the St. Lawrence River region. Dams are ubiquitous with near maximum flow regulation. In the smaller map to the right, one can see where the St. Maurice watershed is located. Um, um, just to the north, the Saguenay River and Lake St. Jean Re Reservoir was developed about 1928. In 20 years, the Saguenay River produced about 2,500 megawatts. I believe the Saguenay and other river hydro development occurring about the same time is why there was a significant tipping point about 1930 in the winter minimum average temperatures as shown in the graph for Point Au Pair. And just uh, remind that Goon Reservoir was built in 1920, and it was the largest reservoir in the world at that time. Okay, next slide. Okay, um, this is one of Steve Kasperzak's uh, works here. Point Au Pair merged winter minimum mean temperature. You'll see that uh, blue line is a tipping point, and we have a pre-1930 median of 12, about 12 and a half degrees. Uh, and then the post-1930 median, the minimum mean temperature is a about 16.85. Uh, so that's about a four degree climb, and it happened almost immediately. And uh, certainly uh, it, something, something was a tipping point, but there's just a lot of dams and reservoirs went online at that time. Uh, I, I like, I, it was color coded to see that they're in the sort of the uh, brownish orange area, there's, there's no points like there was before 1930. So anyway, next, okay. Um, you can see that uh, if we take, this is the annual mean temperature. You can see that uh, the temperature increases. It, uh, if you look at uh, the CO2 uh, reference line, uh, normally if you look back, uh, the temperature rising throughout this time period, in, way back, it sort of correlates with the CO2 because that's a physical law that more CO2 temperature is going to rise. And, uh, but here it uh, went against the laws of nature for some reason. Uh, so uh, uh, there has to be a, <laughs> some other factor affecting it. Okay. Next slide. Now. Could I, could I go back to that slide? Yep. Um, oh, yep. There, yeah. So. Um, I I don't understand the CO two line. It's it's a gas concentration, so it's plotted on the scale of temperature. So how is that concentration related to temperature? Um, it's well, um, we had a, a statistician who did a number of these, who's plotted the CO two versus temperature on, on a lot of graphs. <laughs> For Russian Canada, and uh, this is a segment of that. Uh, I think, that, that, Roger. I think this. I think this graph is missing a second um, x-axis. It doesn't have a y-axis. Um, a y. Yeah. The main thing is to show its its rise is uh, very small um, at that time in that time frame. You know, later on, it it definitely goes up about 1970. You start to see a, a big rise in the CO2 as with the temperature. Okay, so um, 
is this a CO2 concentration there or globally or? It's probably globally because there wasn't. Oh, so it goes back to 1880. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, and I just don't understand. Ethan, I can send you yeah. some of uh, our yeah. mathematician's work. Yeah, we, we've got, we've got, he's, he's written all about it. So. I can send you some of his okay. work. Okay. We, okay. We'd love, we'd love for you to review it. Okay. All right. All right. Appreciate it. Okay. okay. Yeah, I will we'll send go. you his graphs and his work. All yeah. right. We'll go on then. Okay. Um, the uh, global average surface temperature, you'll notice in 19, uh, around 1900 to 1930, the uh, earth was in more of a cooling period overall. But, uh, just to show you that somehow the St. Lawrence River region was not. Um, next slide. And uh, there were more NOI warnings uh, from a lot of his, his uh, articles and just once again summarizing, the dam and flow regulation would cause further loss of salt water and fresh water mixing. He liked to use the word uh, stagnation, resulting in stagnation. It reduced <clears throat> bottom upwelling, warmer winter temperatures, sea ice losses, weaken or alter thermohaline currents, and uh, degrade marine ecosystems. Okay. Now, in a study area he, he worked, uh, this, this uh, dam was put in, um, and he was uh, really concerned about it, the Daniel Johnson Dam on the Manicougan River created the Manic 5 Reservoir, which is one of the larger ones in the world. It's uh, filled an old meteor crater and uh, takes, uh, now it takes about eight years for water in the upper watershed to cycle down through the, uh, <clears throat> through all the dams to the, to the estuary. Whereas before, you can see the rushing river down below, 1919, it took about just several weeks uh, so it's huge changes in the thermal regime and chemistry of, of the river. Next slide. Um, just to give you some reference points here. <clears throat> Here's uh, Gulf of St. Lawrence. Uh, the black lines represent his study area. He was doing a, a study of uh, ice, uh, how ice formed in the St. Lawrence and uh, how it moved, uh, how currents moved. It was a rather expensive government study uh, then. A lot of ships, and, and it wasn't cheap. Um, it was, the study was done in 64, but uh, really, uh, we, it wasn't, we don't think it was allowed to be uh, printed until 1970, and even then it was an abbreviated version. Um, yeah, you can see where the Manic 5 Reservoir is and how Sang, uh, the, uh, sorry, Manicougan flows right into the study area. All right, you got a reference there, okay. Next slide. All right, uh, that Manic 5 is storing the equivalency of 27 Moosehead Lakes, if you know where that is. Um, it's a lot, a lot of water. Uh, it's a lot of energy losses <laughs> uh, in the spring. And that energy is transferred, uh, you know, throughout the winter. All right. Now we go to a hydrograph. Noe drew it, grew up in 76. And we can see, if you look at the, the black line, solid black line, sorry, that's, that's what it is today. The, uh, it's highest, the flow is highest in February and March and lowest in May. That's opposite what it used to be before uh, the Manicougan was dammed. You had about 135,000 cubic uh, feet per second at its uh, apex there. And that's, that's gone. Um, so is that because they want to generate more electricity during the winter months? Yes, yes, exactly. Okay. Um, and, uh, so yeah, um, any more questions? Yeah. You can just see that, uh, now there's 35,000, about 35,000 cubic feet per second throughout the winter, 
where there was probably look way down there at the dotted line. <laughs> it was probably like 200 cubic feet per second. So that's a huge energy change. And you put a lot of energy in at the, to the system at the wrong time of year, which probably, uh, I don't know how the uh, ecosystem handles it, but um, maybe it's adaptable. So uh, Noy didn't think so. But, um, so anyway, this is extreme flow regulation. Okay. You might want to. Oh, oh I forgot some. Thank you, Cliff. Yeah, you also <laughs> might want to mention that. I forgot something. Extreme <laughs> flow regulation is carried all across Canada and into Siberia, storing yeah. storing water for yeah. about five to six months at a time, and it's all the majority of water is discharged in the winter months. Yeah, I, I forgot something though. <clears throat> Go ahead. Uh, well, it's on the next. Well, I'm doing the next one. Go to the next one. Okay. Um, this is a cross section of the St. Lawrence estuary at Point de Monts. Reveals the inward and outward flows. Uh, it's called a you know, salt wedge estuary. You have the blue triangle is fresh water, and it's going out. It goes out on the south side, uh, maybe because of Coriolis effect. Uh, <clears throat> that's what they say. But uh, the 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 red area is, is salt water coming back in. Noy measured this, and uh, he found out that uh, for one one part uh, fresh water going out, uh, fifteen parts were coming back in. Um, the flow or fifteen times. So if you had one, let's say Niagara Falls flow per second going out you would have 15 Niagara Falls per second coming in. It was slower, but it, uh, it was that volume. And that, that happens, it's kind of a uh, kinetic energy formula uh, effect. Um, so it, these high ratios are happening, at least before dams, were happening all over the Arctic when you had the spring freshets. Um, so a lot of... Uh, a lot of energy is lost when uh, you, you, you store that fresh water. All right. Now let's switch to albedo because uh, Noy was concerned about the ice conditions. Um, <clears throat> just to explain, al albedo is reflectivity of sunlight. And uh, if you have new snow on top of ice, you're, you're probably going to get uh, about 90% uh, ref reflectivity of solar energy back into space. If you have open water, you're going to get about 90% absorption of solar energy. So there's a, uh, whether there's ice or not, sea ice, there's a huge change of where the energy goes. So albedo is a very important concept to understand. Okay. The, uh, here's a graph of the annual Arctic sea ice minimum area. It's, uh, Starts in 1970, about the 1970s, and it's uh, really slowly going. And it really started going down um, in the uh, you know 90s, and but then it really dropped. The bottom dropped out <laughs> lately in the 2000s and since the 2000s. A lot of open water um, uh, during the summer now, and uh, a lot of the sea ice is also not the same. It's uh, not. More new ice, less old ice. So uh, keep that in mind. All right, next slide. Now, uh, this is a, a view of the where the Yenisei River uh, and the Obe River come into the Kara Sea. This sea is also known as the ice factory of the Arctic. Um, these rivers, uh, some, of the, some of the largest in the world, have uh, numerous dam, dams on them. Um, so that uh, even though there uh, there's no dams uh, within a, kind of a long distance of their mouths, the the dams uh, in the upper watershed still greatly affect the uh, the flow and the, the spring flow. Steve Kasperzak uh, in his book uh, calculated, you know, this this energy and the the pulse energy and volume of 26 to 38 Niagara Falls. Uh, well, how much was lost? The 26 to 38 Niagara Falls flowing for each second of every day for the month of June 
never reaches the Kara Sea in that 30-day time span as it once did through geologic Arctic Ocean history. <clears throat> now, remember uh, one thing, uh, that 1 to 15 ratio, um, if it happens in the spring, uh, that salt water, you know, it's that deep salt water is about 36 degrees. It's not really going to heat pollute, uh, you know, for the time of year, the uh, estuary and, and river um, and the coastal seas. But in winter, you, you, if you have a, a lot of water flowing out from releasing the reservoirs, it's going to, uh, that's, that's warmer water. And the uh, question is, how much is it heat polluting the, uh, the ice pack? at least from underneath, more from underneath and along the edges. Just a, a question I have. Um, keep in mind, you still have, uh, like the Kola Peninsula is over here, you still have a lot of new water vapor being blown across the, uh, the region. Uh, I'll go over that. Now, this is destroying, whoops. <laughs> well, yeah, it's destroying a delicate balance that the, uh, I think it's destroying a delicate balance that the CIA was talking about. They were worried about the Kola Peninsula when you had, uh, uh, <laughs> we have these two rivers and uh, huge amounts of flows are being disruptive. Okay, go ahead. So let me ask about the, I mean, the, uh -huh. I, think, I think you did say that Russia had planned to divert some of the, the flow inland for irrigation. I'm not sure how much of the flow was diverted, but um, the dams surely changed the timing of the flow exactly. to, the, to the Arctic, but does the Arctic really care what time of year it gets that, wa that fresh water? Um, I would think so because um, the energy pulse is different. Uh, the temperature mm -hmm. is different. Um, there's some other things I'm not going to go over that are different. Um, so uh, I, I would think so. <laughs> you know, that's. Um, I mean, we, we know the that the, the Arctic sea ice minimum is in like September. Mm -hmm. um, but these flows are switching from March and April to January, February um, when there's lots of sea ice so mm -hmm. how does that affect here's a, another thing to think about steve and others the cumulative effect of changing a historical relationship of these rivers to the ocean particularly the heat budget in the dead of winter the cumulative effect eats away on the ice over time. I, I don't know if from these two big rivers, if the temperature doesn't, uh, in, the, in that long f distance of the river is, is too much of a factor, but it's the interaction of fresh water and salt water that never was there before yeah. the dams that, that to me is the most scary. You know, it, there's changes uh, uh, in mixing that, uh, and that, these are questions that aren't being answered. We're just, would love them to be in the, somebody to answer them and talk about them. You know, where does all that, what does all that winter flow do? It's got to do something. So those are, those are all good questions. Uh, Can I mention something here about James Bay? Uh, Roger, do you mind? Uh, oh. That might kind of help answer some of that uh, fellow's questions. I'm sorry I wasn't on at first. This is Roberta Benefield with uh, Grand Riverkeeper in Labrador. Um, if you would like to go online and check out a um, website called the Arctic Eider Society, there is a documentary there that talks about after the dams were um, built and came on stream in James Bay, that the, um, the, the fresh water, which of course is lighter in density than the salt water, lay on the top all winter long and the eider ducks were um were dying uh because they don't 
migrate. And so all along the Belcher Islands where the people from Santa Kilowatt live and have used the eider ducks for their clothing and for and actually sell the down, uh, they were they were in dire straits. And and there's a documentary on that website called People of a Feather. It would it would do a lot of good for people to review that, uh, listen to it, and understand how the Arctic actually receives and what happens to the saltwater versus freshwater mixing or not, and what is taking place for, for not just the water issue, but the fish that live there, the birds that depend on it, and so on. So I would really um, recommend that anyone who wants to know about one thing in particular that I know of, I know the young man who is the scientist, Joel Heath. Thank and, you, Roberta. Thanks. Yeah. yeah. We got to keep moving here. I yes, just got a I lot know. to go. I know. Okay. Um, <laughs> yeah, just to go back to um, Arctic energy imbalance. Uh, it's uh, this is from uh, several scientists are talking about it that uh, EEI, as we call that's what we call it, since 2000 is occurring because of a decreased reflection of energy back into space by clouds and sea ice and the growing presence of greenhouse gases and water vapor. From 2000 to 2014, the rate of increase of EEI in June, July, and August was 5% in the Arctic. The global rate of EEI change outside of the Arctic has remained essentially the same. No other region except in the Arctic in this time period shows a trend of change. Now, the change in the Arctic is equivalent to the energy addition of Her four Hiroshima atomic bomb explosions every second in June, July, and August. Next slide. Hold, hold on. I, I just want to I want to absorb that. Back. I want to absorb that a little bit. Okay. Um, so the solar energy. The global, the global has the rate of change has essentially remained the same. Okay. That's up to 2014. That's maybe. I... Um, but the um, the Arctic rate of increase. <clears throat> That's because of the loss of the sea ice and the change in the albedo. Yeah, and, and, and uh, greenhouse gases like water vapor. Right. Yeah, certainly the sea ice makes a difference there. Um, and the CO2 is going to be potentially greater in the Arctic, but maybe not so much. But OK, so. So. Um, then the question is, what what role do the dams play in that? How much that water vapor? increases due to the dams right. and right. how much of the sea that. ice changes due to the dams. Right, exactly. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Hey, Roger. I'll talk about it. Okay, next slide. Um, okay. Um, here on the Kola, go back to the Kola Peninsula here. Sorry. We got a, a blow up section of it. Um, of course, just to show you that they put a lot of dams on this and uh, starting in, you know, early and then there was some uh, the real large one in 52. Um, and uh, you can see that uh, I think this is, uh, we also have weather stations at Canaan Noss and Dixon. Um, keep keep with mind what those are. So go ahead, uh, next slide. This one shows, they peppered this uh, Kola Peninsula with dams. These are just two couple river systems. So uh, there's a lot of uh, open water and it's right next to the ocean. So like the Barents Sea and the White Sea, just, it, it was, uh, you had a lot of, hot, I'll call it warmer water coming in there. So you, uh, more more water to evaporate. So next slide. Now, <clears throat> Dixon, which showed you is about a thousand miles away. What happens, 1952, where that, especially with that big Neva reservoir went in, uh, boom, your precipitation, cumulative, annual pr cumulative precipitation was almost nothing each year, and then it jumps to almost uh, about five, uh, five, five inches, 5.8 inches. 
Mm-hmm. Um, that's that was, and it stays up there. Um, mm-hmm. Now, Dixon in the summer, there's a little bit of jump, but really no change, and there's still a, a large range of, so uh, nothing significant there. It's always the winter when you have there's the smoking gun is the water vapor. Okay, next slide. Kane and Noss, which is a little closer, showed the same thing. Um, you had a jump. Of course, it had a little little more uh, precipitation to begin with. And uh, see, the Arctic's really arid, so you don't have much precipitation in the winter until, well, until these dams showed up. And again, no summer, summer precipitation didn't really significantly change. Next slide. Um, just to show you, we have, uh, go to some more central Russia, um, down you have the, where the Bratz Dam is, the, Kra- the Krasnoyarsk Dam, Novobursk. Some of these, Irkutsk, uh, down by Lake Bacall. These, some of these were built in, one of them was 57, some of them 67. Uh, Chern- Chernyshevsky is a weather station. Vilyusk was a Vilyu Dam in 67. But there we go where the arrow is, is Jakus. A weather station, real cold area of, of uh, Siberia. Um, and uh, let's see what happens there as far as tipping points. Go ahead. Next slide. Well, I forgot to uh, mention this. Uh, wind roses. So you, you see that uh, just like uh, in the Kola Peninsula, the, w- the wind blows west to east. And, and uh, really predominant winds here. Uh, at Krasnoyarsk, uh, southwest to uh, to um, Northeast and west to east. Uh, Chernyshevsky, same thing, mainly west. Um, so there's blowing water vapor from these dams right to Jakust. Go ahead, next one. Uh, the winter cumulative precipitation um, went from uh, 1.5 median before 1957. That's not much, um, but it, it went up to about uh, 2.35. Well, that's not a lot of, but uh, it's significant when you snow on the ground. Um, you get more snow on the ground, more insulation, you can affect permafrost. Um, the uh, Jakust annual average temperature, though, uh, we, we used a hinge point of 67. Um, and uh, you can see it was actually cooling since 1880 or 1885, not sure. You go to uh, 1967, and uh, you have an upward turn. You know, is it is it the water vapor? Uh, other factors, you know. And, and the dam was built when? Uh, the Vilu, 1967. That's pretty close by. Okay. Uh, just something to wonder about. <laughs> uh, next slide. Okay, let's switch to Canada. All right, here's a map. The... Uh, Red numbers are hydroelectric uh, systems, uh, not just one dam, but a bunch of them, little dots, you can, little red dots uh, everywhere. And the, the, the black numbers are, are weather stations. Um, so uh, in the little, the red map, of course, the bigger red map is, or, or the blown up little red map is the uh, La Grande River uh, system, all those reservoirs, uh, just one after another across Across Quebec. Okay. Next one. All right. Wind roses. Um, the Radisson one, uh, you know, next to uh, um, near the Barrasso Amps is uh, blowing it, well, straight up towards uh, Greenland. Kujuak, uh, same thing. Uh, you notice there are some north south too. Um, there's summertime winds are different. Um, but sometimes there's very strong winds. You see those little sort of orangish red ones on the outside. Very windy region. Um, next slide. Uh, just the Barrasso Dam is there. It's real close to Hudson Bay. That's probably why you have the Eider problem that uh, Roberta was mentioning, you know, hypolemial flows. Kujuak weather station. Now this Brisee Dam was started to be built in the field and diverted the Canasco River in the in the 80s, later 80s, and went online in 1993, became operational. Um, took all the water from uh, Canasco River and uh, diverted it down to the Barrasso Dam. 
Uh, next slide. Uh, across the bay, Hudson Bay, you have the Nelson River estuary, a bunch of dams on that, um, a lot of heat pollution. The estuary uh, has a hard time freezing, usually doesn't freeze. Um, the river and the estuary unfrozen. Um, this, you're going to have a lot of uh, water vapor um, here. Uh, a lot of a lot of change. A lot of yeah, warmer water for the bay. Um, next slide. Just a couple things I'm going to talk about. Uh, these need more discussion because uh, uh, complica they're complicated for me. Seems like you need th three uh, PhDs to be a uh, to even understand weather. Uh, meteorology, um, just to be able to tackle all the uh, information involved in it. Uh, sublimation, uh, sort of the uh, scientific uh, uh, definitions, uh, it's evaporation that occurs in arid condition and it cools the snowpack. All right. Um, that's very important. It cools the snowpack. When condensation, however, when the air is humid, condensation transfers water molecules to the snowpack and warms it and melts it. I guess that's why on a foggy night, even though it's cold, colder, you lose a lot of snowpack. And because of these dams, we have more condensation in the cold months and extreme reduction in the snowpack. Okay, next slide. Now, this is something we'd love to see discussed more in the a lot of questions to ask, a lot more data to needs to be looked at um, and analyzed, but uh, here, here is for starters. This is the uh, temperature graph of uh, Greenland, southwest Greenland, from uh, before 1800 um, to 2013. It has it extrapolated to show that uh, it'd be 21, year 2125 before it hit zero degrees centigrade if you were on the same line. But in 1993, um, it's, it took an upward turn, a sharp upward turn, and it reached zero degrees in 2013. That, that year, 2000, I mean, 1993, again and again. Okay, next one. Uh, Eureka weather station up there. Uh, sort of northwest uh, of uh, west of Greenland, northwest of Greenland. Um, even a lot of more glaciers up there too. It's uh, you can also uh, well, I think I have a, show the map again. Um, explain that. All right, go uh, go to the next slide. Eureka, the weather state, uh, the graph for it. Um, it's too bad we don't have more data for Canada, but. If you're missing data, you can't show the dot. That's the that's the rule we had when we uh, when we an, we had people analyze it. I mean, make make these graphs. Um, but uh, it, it it appeared to stay pretty even level uh, since before the 1950s, and then 1993 it took off by over four degrees. Um, <clears throat> here's 1993 again. All right, next one. Uh, the Greenland melt area is interesting. It, it went in stages. Um, it was, of course, melting uh, before uh, from before 1985. Um, had a, even that was alarming. And then uh, it jumped in '86 uh, to '93 a little bit. There was a lot of, uh, of course, dam diversion going on in Quebec. And then when the Brisee went online in '93. You can see again the melting uh, melt area just greatly increased. Um, once again, 1993. Um, okay, next one. Uh, that uh, 1993, we'll look at the, uh, this is from the Portland Press Herald, uh, some graphs there. Main shrinking snowpack. You can see that uh, 1993, uh, the snowpack. Uh, really showed a sharp uh, decrease in, in annually. Uh, you go down here, look at the warming winter rate, and you can see that after 1993, there was a, sh um, uh, a real increase in, in Maine's warming winters, 93, okay. 
Next, next slide. Let's go down and look at the bottom of this. You see where Kujawak is, pardon my pronunciation, uh, right near Agave Bay. That's where the Hudson flows out. And right, right there is where the Kanasco River waters used to come out. And uh, can you imagine now they have to flow all the way around uh, a thousand miles to the Barassa Dam and back up here. Um, it's a huge, big energy change. And it's a lot more time for water to evaporate and uh, um, change in chemical, physical nature. All right. So uh, let's look at Kujuak. Now, remember I talked about uh, sublimation and condensation. So what happens in Kujuak in the winter with snow depth? Well, we look at uh, um, tipping point 1980, Barasso Dam, and all those dams down there were, were built. Um, do you see that... Uh, the, the median snowpack was 18.2 before the Barasso Dam. And then uh, post Barasso Dam from 1980 to 92 was 15. Okay, it dropped a few inches. But then after 93, Versailles Dam, it drops to 9.5. That's, that's, a, that's a huge drop from 18 to 9. Now, you would expect that... Uh, you know, the ground in some years, depending on precipitation, the, the ground probably is going to dry out sooner. Uh, there'll be less uh, spring water flow in, in the rivers, uh, but it's, it's going to cause problems. Next slide. Now, in, we've seen more fires in, in Quebec, and uh, especially increased numbers of fires and intensity. And... Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if there's a connection with the increased humidity from amps and apparent reduced winter month snowpack, drier summer soil contact. Um, the north-south winds can blow it right to Maine. I think we've experienced that. Okay. Now, the temperatures, uh, the, they do ten, uh, temperature min-max means, um, that uh, show, well, the temperatures were, uh, well, they used tipping points of 1980 and in, in, in the early 90s. Uh, regardless which ones you use, they show that uh, the temperatures were not rising prior, prior to those tipping points. In fact, sometimes they were going down. But there was a considerable increase in temperatures. Uh, three to four degrees in just a few years, a uh, decade or so. Next. Also, precipitation. Uh, you think, well, there was less precipitation, so is there going to be less snowpack? Nope. Precipitation goes up a little bit uh, in the annual precipitation. So um, it's not precipitation it's a fault. There's a, a change in the atmosphere in, uh, in the humidity. Next slide. Now, um, one thing I want to mention uh, is uh, for the future discussion, and uh, you know, is there a, a Russian Canadian uh, roulette going on with uh, with mega dams in the uh, AMOC? Uh, I think I tried to pronounce it: the Atlantic Meridional uh, Overturning Circulation. Um, it's a complicated circulation system that uh, I could be affected, or I, I believe it is, um, by, by the, what's going on with Arctic mega dams. Uh, these mega dams affect the things that, that uh, the AMOC is sensitive to. The mega dams, uh, changes in seasonal flow energy, they change density, uh, having to do with salinity, fresh water. Uh, changes and also ocean temperature changes. And the results of the impacts, of course, devastation to fisheries, uh, slow down stoppage of Gulf Stream current. You know, I put question marks because uh, even the experts, I don't know, know uh, when and how. Um, major increase in northeastern U.S. sea level, uh, drastic climate change for northern Europe and New England. So, uh, I'd like to, uh, uh, we need to, <laughs> mega dams should be on the, in the same uh, discussion as CO2 for the uh, 
AM, AMOC, I believe. All right, next slide. All right. Um, I just want to say there's uh, the next uh, webinar. There's uh, more, to, uh, more to come on major impacts. Uh, join us in January 25 for a fulsome discussion on how the loss of diatoms is ac exacerbating the warming of the climate and what role dams and reservoirs play in their destruction. Um, I'm going to, the last bullet there is uh, really, uh, really concerning. Um, we are losing diatoms at the rate of 1 to 2 percent per year since 1998. Um, so, uh, that's not good since uh, through geologic time they have uh, regulated our climate. So anyway, at that, um, I'll go to the next one. <laughs> next slide. Uh, there's uh, Arctic Blue Deserts. Uh, we can, there's some uh, websites there. You can navigate, help you get these. You can email me or something if you, if you need help getting one of these. We, we'd love to send them out. Um, you can read the uh, essays by Steve Kasperzak. Uh, they're, they're very helpful in understanding what's going on. Um, I guess at this point, we can stop, take questions, or uh, turn it over to the, the host. <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank you, Roger. OK, okay. I'm going to uh, moderate the discussion now. So if you have a question or a comment, uh, please use the raise your hand, um, and I'll call on people in the order that I see them. Okay, Stephen, yes, go right ahead. Yeah, so what I'm seeing here is uh, certainly a pretty strong lake effect of having all that water in these reservoirs in the fall and winter, and I presume that it must, the surface of the reservoir must freeze and then, um, but the dams are letting out water in the winter months to produce electricity. So you have water running below the dams that um, it takes a while to freeze. So it's, it's a, quite a source of, of heat and water to the atmosphere and pretty strong local effects. Um, away from the reservoirs, there's more going on. There's there's uh, transported heat from uh, lower latitudes, and there's um, the global warming um, going on, and it's really hard to separate out the effects of the reservoirs from the general CO two effects um, uh, driving the global warming. So, um, I I have asked. Um, someone who does surface water modeling to add this sort of a mechanism into a, a global climate model. And so he's, he's going to have someone look at that and it will probably take years for it to, to be published. But um, it is an intriguing problem. Um, and I, it's not clear to me what this, the answer is. Um, but I would caution you to not be real conclusive at this point because um, there's more than one thing going on, for sure. And, and we don't know quantitatively which is more important. Thank you, Stephen. Yeah, thank you. Anyone else? Questions, comments? A lot Don, of stuff. Don Ferber had a suggestion. Don, do you want to unmute? Yeah, it was just when you made the comparison about energy, I forget it was one of the dams or something, um, that you compared it to Hiroshima atomic bomb explosions. And that's, I find, a little bit hard to relate. So I was thinking, you know, if you could do it somehow in megawatts or units of energy that we can relate to, that might be more useful. Am, am I on? Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, okay. Yeah, the uh, article used uh, so many millions of everybody, a tea kettle or something, you know, in the article. Uh, they, they equated to that, too. So, yes, that was another comparison. Sorry, I wasn't looking if it was Cliff or Roberta who, who put their hand up first. 
Okay, Roberta. <laughs> nope. Actually, what all I want to say is that at this point in time, the IPCC and no other country that I know of other than the United States has finally started asking some of their dam operators to produce uh, some kind of accounting on uh, greenhouse gases. And I mean, not just CO2, but methane, and methane is a super important one. But uh, I think what we're asking and and what, what we want to see is for the scientific community to pick up on this and let's find out what is actually going on, um, you know, and, and let's start adding that there are 65,000 dams in the world. Mm -hmm. Not all of them are in the Arctic, obviously, but most of the big ones are in the Arctic or, or will affect the Arctic. And what we're asking is that all of these things start to be pulled together uh, stop looking at things in silos and look at how these huge uh, uh, currents are impacted and look at the global issue, which is really the most important issue when you're talking about climate change, and let's get it quantified. That is our, that's what we want to do. Exactly. Thank you, Roberta. Go ahead, Cliff. Uh, just a comment. Um, we are, as a group, we are not stating that our work on dams is going to lead us to finding that this is the main reason. We understand the how complex it is, uh, particularly, and it is complex. However, the one few areas that need more research is the hydrological cycles of the earth. And when you think of the Arctic, people don't usually think of the hydrology. They think of the ice, but water and ice are closely related. And my point is that historically, the Arctic Ocean is one of the warmest oceans in terms of keeping ice on the planet. It is much warmer than the Antarctic. Now, the Arctic Ocean maintains ice at almost near freezing. And if there's any little change with the hydrology that goes into that Arctic Ocean, what is the first thing that happens is the damage to that ice sheet the, the, you know, up there because it's so delicate and it's hovering around freezing, it's the water. So any little change because of its such sensitivity to temperature up there is going to make a major change to the ice. That's my point. And people forget about that. Yeah. That's a good point, Cliff. Thanks for sharing that. You know, another point that I would like to uh, add, which is something that uh, wasn't highlighted that much in Roger's presentation, is <clears throat> if you look at the size of the reservoirs, that have been created from all the dams. <clears throat> You're looking at a huge amount of what used to be land, which is now water surface, which has increased just by physical fact, has increased the amount of, of, of uh, evaporation into the atmosphere. And NASA has done studies on this. We have uh, references to those um, in our, in our, uh, in our, what do you call it? In our, in our library um, that that is showing a lot of concern about the increased evaporation um, into the atmosphere, creating more cloud cover, creating more precipitation. I mean, we're certainly looking at some pretty wild uh, precipitation events around the planet just in the last year. I think it was this past summer, there was 19 inches of rain falling in uh, Eastern Europe, I mean, unheard of. So uh, that's, a, that's a factor that goes into how the dams are creating climate change that I think also needs to be addressed. 
Okay. Becky. Other questions or comments? Becky, I see you have your hand up. Yeah. Um, I just um, think that, you know, talking about water vapor and talking about increased precipitation, um, and I think that uh, one of the points that, that you have made, but maybe needs to be uh, highlighted, um, Roger, is the impact on the on Greenland, which is we're losing so much of that ice, those glaciers um, there. And I think that that's, um, you know, it, with the windrows information and the amount of water vapor that is headed that direction and fog, um, I think that's, to me, one of the smoking gun in terms of uh, at least some portion of why we're losing so much of Greenland's ice. Am I right there? I believe so. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Okay. Other comments or questions? Uh, Stephen, yes, go ahead. Yeah, I do, I do want to make uh, one other comment um, about um, risk management. You know, it, it, in terms of climate change, there are there's a lot a lot going on. Um, there's there's a CO two and um, aerosols and um, and in terms of solutions, they they all have uh, drawbacks. There's, there's no silver bullet here. And the fact that, you know, dams, they are a source of methane. They are putting up water um, in the winter months. Um, you have to weigh that against the the emissions that they are preventing, the CO2 emissions that they're preventing. And and we, we, we can't be dismissing solutions uh, because they have some negative effects. Mm -hmm. um, there's, yeah, there's no single solution mm -hmm. here that doesn't have effects. They all have effects. Right. Right. And, and so we need to be quantitative about this. Yeah. Are, the, are the positives outweighing the negatives or not? Good point. Roberta, you need to unmute yourself. Uh, I agree with that. I agree that there are um, impacts and that no matter how we uh, go ahead, we're going to have to get energy, we're going to have impacts. One thing I would say about dams is that it's not just greenhouse gas. It's not just methane. It's not just uh, the things that you normally think about um, that cause climate change, we're talking about so many other impacts to fisheries, to the mm -hmm. diatoms, to so many different things that are ecologically damaging, biodiversity damaging, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. It's not just... Uh, you know, CO2 or methane or climate, mm -hmm. uh, climate, uh, the, the ones you normally think about. And mm -hmm. the social impacts, oh my God, the social impacts of these dams on the people surrounding, I mean, I'm, I'm here in Labrador, uh, Muskrat Falls, Churchill Falls, um, you know, the impacts it's had on us in our own little tiny community of 7,800 people. The construction of these dams has destroyed our community, uh, not destroyed our community in, in a sense of we're gone, but, you know, there are so many people who are against each other here in the community because of the way this project, these projects are produced. So I think we need to consider a lot more about dams than just what you consider as the sea, you know, the, the, climate. the climate change effects. Yes. Thank right. You. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. I see Shelly has her hand up. You'll need to unmute yourself, Shelly. Okay. Sorry. Um, Shit. Excuse me, I'm so sorry. Um, I guess I wanted to say that rather than thinking about the emissions that we're preventing by 
by using dams instead of like gasoline is kind of missing the point in 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 the point that it's a really delicate ecosystem in the Arctic that we haven't even really done a whole lot with because it's kind of inhospitable there. And we don't really know what the effects are going to be. And we should be really careful to go intervening, I, I guess. It, it's because there's there's problems with dams everywhere, not just in the Arctic, but I guess what I want to say is um rather than trying to think of it as a, this is the best of like two scenarios where the other is gasoline, we, we should really consider how, well, like the lady from Labrador was saying, how damaging it is to those particular communities, you know? Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Anyway. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Anyone else like to input here? One more comment. Okay, yeah. As Steve said, there are, there are many variables and which one is better than another. The point in fact is we are an educational organization that's trying to make a point that we haven't done enough studies, as Shelley just said, of what is happening and what has happened in the Arctic. And there are lots of studies about ice and lots of studies about permafrost, but nobody is linking the so few studies that link what happened in the 50s to the 90s to why in the 70s the permafrost started to feed back melt by itself and i've read study after study and nobody points fingers to the hydrology being changed the amount of water as Halsey has set up there is huge and when you cover a cold dry area with water the permafrost melts. It starts to melt because of radiated heat from the sun, long days, 16, 20 hours a day of sun in the summertime. So there are many factors, like Shelley said, we can't discount any. We're in a, a climate emergency and we're here for an educational, as an educational organization to say, hey, why are we overlooking the Arctic and the hydrology up there? Thank you, Cliff. Roberta, yes, please unmute. Yeah, just a quick one uh, for the lady, uh, Shelley, who talked about the impacts or the um, um, the Arctic. I can't remember what, what exactly she said. But anyway, um, just, just a little note that the breast milk of the Inuit who live in the Arctic contains some of the worst toxins and it's because of the Arctic situation that these toxins are building up more in the Arctic than anywhere else. That's just one little example of how Arctic situations have to be looked at in a different way. So I agree with Shelley that, that we need to be super careful what we do in the Arctic. Mm -hmm. That's it for me. Thank you, Roberta. Becky? Um, I just, you know, as we're talking about all this, and I think this is an incredibly important aspect for us to be looking at because of all of the rivers that have been dammed, two thirds of the world's rivers, um, and and continuing. We know that uh, Hydro Quebec plans to dam sixteen more uh, rivers just to provide electricity for the United States um, in their. This is in their um, annual planning and that was their old one now i think there's even more um but the um the thing that i want to remind us all of because i need to be reminded myself is that we are not doing enough work to increase or decrease the use of energy we yes. can be much more efficient about everything we do and reduce the amount of energy that's required and i think we've got to pay a lot of attention to ai and Bitcoin and really hold them accountable for the amount of energy that those two, you know, magical things that everyone's excited about are sucking out of the um, the energy that everybody else needs to use. So, I mean, as we're going forward in our policy directions, you know, efficiency needs to really be hammered home and it's not sexy. I've been talking about it since the seventies and it's not something that gives me a golden halo um, mm -hmm. because it just, it, 
it it falls on deaf ears mostly. So, yeah. um, but I think it's really important for us to really focus on that. Thanks, Thank Becky. And I, I'm re, I'm recalling a uh, a point that was made in our second webinar um, by our one of our speakers uh, from uh, the Foundation Riviere in Quebec that. Uh, that because of all of Hydro Quebec's dams and and their work creating electricity through the damming, the electricity in Quebec is so cheap that there's no incentive for people to to uh, pay attention to efficiency at all because the electricity is so cheap. So there's a point from one of the sources there. Just, just so everyone knows, when Hydro Quebec built their their uh, main office building, they didn't even put switches on the walls to shut down the electricity. I understand they now have. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Other comments. Uh, Holly. Yeah, just a quick question. This is the first time I've attended uh, one of your sessions and. Uh, it's really excellent. Um, I was wondering if, and you may have already, and irregardless of all of the other um, significant issues like the cultural issues and uh, the effects on diatoms and fisheries and all of that, which are really important, has anyone in your group done the, well, what would happen if um, in instead of using um, electricity that these dams would produce, if you would uh, substitute that for uh, other carbon-based forms of electricity. And that's not to say that that's what someone should do because they shouldn't, that that electricity should be generated by um, renewable and as close to clean and zero uh, sources as possible. but is there somewhere where you've begun to look at what would the um, substituted, uh, for now I'll just say carbon-based uh, electricity be if you took those dams offline, uh, the major ones? Let's, let's use Canada because that's something that I think we'd have a hard time affecting what happens in Russia, but we might be able to affect what happens in Canada and perhaps the northern um, uh, U.S. Yeah, that's a point. And uh, I, I think that's uh, similar to the point that um, Stephen was making earlier. I don't know if that analysis has been done. Uh, it's certainly, certainly something to look into. And, uh, and I think we're also at a point where, you know, we're moving away from carbon-based fuels for energy production and there's there's enough in the pipeline now on other really renewable energies that I think that we could we could we could with planning um, see an effect uh, uh, in in a way that would allow us to see being able to take more dams offline. Roberta, I'm going to hold off on you for just a second to give Philip a chance to input here. Thank you. Um, I just Holly Holly's question raise something for me that I've always thought on this topic, which is just that the, the distinction between dams that are like currently operational and dam and proposing new dams is, is really important here. Like I, I've come around to the perspective that there's really no reason we should be building dams for hydropower at all, because there are better alternatives. I think the, the sort of the, the premise of decommissioning a dam just to choose a different power source is sort of unrealistic. Like that's not what would actually happen in these cases uh, and dam removal. Like it's such a long process that it's going to take time. But the, as far as like new energy demand comes, the, the simplest thing would just be stopping sort of the incentivization of additional dam construction. Like I think that is the, in terms of the action steps that can happen right now, the most important thing, or if you want to take the more sort of capitalistic approach, uh, you know, coming up with even bigger incentives for alternatives to hydropower over the more expensive or, or over the, the currently cheaper options. So 
that's sort of how I think about it. Thank you, Philip. Appreciate that. Go ahead, Roberta. Yeah, and 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 on on to that too. Uh, I know that a lot of the dam owners in the United States are at this point in time looking at, uh, you know, how they can increase the amount of um, of uh, megawatts they get from their dams, and also, um, you know, we, we to, for the ecological problems. There are ways to make fish passage um, more reliable or even to instigate fish passages in many of these dams. Yeah, so the, the problem in Canada is that we have like 68% of our energy is coming from dams. And we think that because we have so much water that we should be building more dams because we can sell it to the United States. And it, it isn't necessarily that we need more energy in Canada. We just want to make more money, which yeah. is crazy. Yeah. We're coming down to the end of our time. So, uh, Cliff, I see you've got your hand up. Um, one more quick comment. Um, Historically, we've, we've started to do a lot in the world to try to reduce reduce the amount of heat that the planet keeps gaining. And the only area that we're not really focusing on, on is the most natural places on the planet, which is the equatorial and the polar regions. We can have an effect on the Arctic if we understand how sensitive it is and the fact that there is a change going on up there that's happening twice as fast as the rest of the planet. Mm -hmm. And we cannot ignore that by thinking, well, the dams are already built. We'll just stop other dams. Mm -hmm. What is happening up there is significant and is going on every single year. And we know the climate's getting warmer every single year. So my point to Philip is, we can't accept what's there if it's destroying our planet. Mm -hmm. And we have a hunch that it may be doing that. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Um, with that, we're going to say thank you to Roger for your presentation. Thank you to everyone for being here and being part of this conversation. And we look forward to seeing you again um, in January as we continue uh, with a new series of webinars um, on this and related topics. So thank you all and good night. I think you can stop the recording now.